Hebrews. If you go back there to Grace's Coffee Shop, in the back, back here by the Fellowship Hall, somebody made up a sign that said, He Brews. <laughs> Whatever He Brews, it better be the right kind of brews. When I grew up in the mountains in Tennessee, there was the right kind of brew and the wrong kind of brew. Some was made out of tater skins and corn mashing. A few of you old folks know what that is. That's frog eyes in a mason jar. Now a few more of you are getting it. It's more clear than water. It's a great antiseptic. It's very similar to rubbing alcohol. Some of you now, you're starting to, oh, 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 now I think I know what he's talking about. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about coffee. <laughs> but the book of Hebrews has got some great things in it. And if you read the book of Hebrews long, you'll find out that there's a theme in the book of Hebrews. It's called better things. And it points out that the Lord Jesus Christ is better than a whole lot of things. And I feel like this morning just preaching on how much better he is than all things. But the Lord would draw us to this text here. The Bible says in verse number 2, chapter 12, verse 2. Ain't that a blessing hearing that instead of clicks on a pad or a phone? Did you hear that? That onion skin paper? Man, that's good. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Watch it carefully now. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Brother Larry, take us to the throne. Yes. Thank you for coming by. Okay. Taking time to stop by with us. Lord, thank you for what we've heard and been a part of this morning. This, our missionary, your missionary. God, what a blessing, a true blessing he was to us. Amen. How we look forward to the message this morning. I pray you be your preacher's help. I pray God you speak to it. I pray you preach to us. In Jesus Christ's name, we'll give you the glory. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. Can I get your attention for just a few minutes this morning to try to drive a point home that the Apostle Paul in his warning says that in the last days many will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and many shall depart from the faith. Can I say again to you that that warning is to Christians, that warning is not to the world. That warning is not to individuals that are caught up in all kind of false doctrine and all kind of heresies. That warning is to us as Christians that in the last days, there's going to be spiritual influence outside of the Holy Spirit that is going to try to draw you away, to seduce you is the biblical word, to pull you away from the most important thing, and that's your fellowship with Jesus Christ. And so much so that Paul says, even so, when he's giving Timothy instructions, he says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come, not maybe, not shall, will come when they, the, the church, will heap to themselves after their own lust, teachers having itching ears and be turned from the truth unto fables. 
Paul gives us specific warnings that in the last days, we have to be very, very cautious that something doesn't draw us away. The book of Galatians says that you fell from a standing position. You didn't lose your salvation, but the doctrinal issues begin to fade and they begin to become unimportant. And we don't pay attention to truth like we used to. And we take the church and the scriptures and we take prayer life and preaching for granted. And before long, it is something of the anger ancient past. Paul warns us as Christians in Laodicea when John writes in the book of, uh, through the Holy Spirit in the book of Revelation chapter number three, he said, listen to me, the time's going to come when you become lukewarm and that you're going to think you're rich and increased with goods and you're going to think you're doing absolutely wonderful, but the Lord says you're blind and you're naked and you're destitute and you have need of him again. Why does he give us those warnings? Why in this passage and why is it necessary for us to remind ourselves that even in church, even in a Bible believing church, that we need to pay attention as the days draw closer and closer to the end and the curtains begin to close. Paul warns us, Jesus warns us, hey, be careful. Because you too can be a castaway. You too can be out. You too can still be saved and have no thought whatsoever of the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Amen. I think that there are some reasons in these last days that Christians get out and I think it's because we stop considering him. I think we oftentimes get weary in what we call well-doing, but can I say this to you? The first thing is important. If you're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have to do so in the Spirit because the Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Amen. You can't accomplish what our missionary has accomplished in the flesh. You can't last a long period of time. Individuals that get as a part of church work and they do it just for recognition or for appreciation, you're not going to last very long. You say, why? Because the flesh is wearing out. All it takes is a few years on you after you get out of high school to begin to realize the old gray mare ain't what she used to be. It doesn't take long that for that person staring back at you that you see every day has got wrinkles on their face and teeth coming out of their head and all of a sudden their hairline begins to move backward and the belly begins to move forward and all the things you said would never happen all of a sudden begin to happen. And that 100 pound sack of fertilizer just well weigh 1,000 pounds because you look at that thing and think, bring me a dolly, I ain't about to pick that up. You try to serve God in your flesh, you're not going to last very long. It cannot be done with just main strength and awkwardness. It can't be done by just trying to hunker down and grabbing and growl. The only thing that's going to keep you going is to be able to walk in the Spirit, Galatians chapter number 5, because the flesh does not want to do anything with God whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it's at enmity with God. It is against God. There is nothing in your flesh, even seated here right now, all dressed up, perfumed up, got makeup on the barn, all those kinds of things. It still, it shudders being here. You just happen to have it under control for the next few minutes. And one of the things that happens in Christian service is oftentimes people bite off more than they can chew. I'm for serving the Lord, but I'm for God being the one that calls you. I believe that it's important for you to realize that anybody that has ever been successful for any length of time in any ministry, including the ministry of riding the pew, has done so because they never quit putting the Bible in and they had a prayer life. It is the sustenance that sustains you during the difficult times. You cannot expect to go on in a spiritual realm and not feed yourself spiritually. It cannot be done. Now you look at the old greats that have gone on, Dr. Ruckman being one, Brother Roloff being one, and many of the other ones. I can remember years ago when we were in Romania. And I happened to get real sick on the way over there and I laid on the floor of the plane going over and they got me some NyQuil and some aspirin and stuff like that and I laid in a, a place there in Romania and at about 4.30 in the morning I, there was a light on and it was, happened to be right in my eyes and I looked through the hallway where we were staying and I looked over there in the kitchen and in the kitchen there was a chair turned around like this chair right here. And Brother Jim Lentz was in there back next to that chair with that little light on like that. And he was like this. And I saw him turn the page. 
And I watched him read for a little while, and then I saw him turn the page. And after a little while, he finally got up from there. I kept dozing off and coming back around. He was still there. And I called him back there. He came. He said, P, are you feeling any better? And I said, I think maybe a, a little bit better. I said, what were you doing? And he said, what do you mean, what was I doing? And I said, what were you doing in the kitchen? He said, I was reading my Bible. And I said, well, why were you reading your Bible on your knees? He said, well, I've read it through so many times. Sitting down, I promised the Lord before I died. I'd read it at least one time through on my knees. Christian, I'm going to tell you right now that one of the quickest things that'll kick you out of the ministry, that'll kick you out of serving God, it'll kick you out of church attendance, it'll kick you out of doing anything. If you leave off Bible reading and you leave off prayer, I got news for you. You're not going to last very long. Amen. You can't do without the bread of life. You can't do without the words of life. You can't do with the apples of gold and the silver that's in that Bible. You can't do without the water that flows from the wells that are in there and the deep seas that are in there of the things of God. You've got to have that to feed the spirit. You can't do this in the flesh. You won't be able to withstand what we're going to talk about. You will be so easily offended, man. All of a sudden, you're getting out and you're quitting and you don't know why because you're in the flesh. You're in the spirit. You know what winds up happening to you is, is you realize, hey, we're here for a bigger reason and a bigger cause. But it's changed nowadays because we try to operate sometimes more like we're trying to run a business or a company than we are trying to do something spiritual. We're an organism, has been said, not an organization. In the flesh, the fleshy things can pull us down, can't they? I mean, you know, you think when you're young, if I could just get a house and get a car, but then you don't realize it before long, then the house has to be paid for and repairs have to be made and the windows don't work like they're supposed to and the screens that you never use anyway, they got to be cleaned in case you ever do decide to raise them up in Florida at 95 degrees, 100% humidity. But just in case you decide to do it, got to clean the screens. And the baseboards have to be scrubbed because who knows going to come by with a white glove and check to see. Before long, the refrigerator goes down. And then the washing machine. And then you call about the washing machine. That's a great thing in the day and time in which we live. You finally get somebody on the phone. And nowadays, it's no longer somebody in India. Nowadays, it's a computer talking like a person. And you know it's not a person, but you're so glad to hear somebody on the other end of the phone, you're now talking like an idiot to a computer. And they ask you all kind of questions and they tell you, you know, do you have your serial number? And so you run and get it and you take a picture and you go do that. And then they say, do you have the model number? And then you run over there and you get it and then you come back with a model number. And then they go, oh, we don't fix that kind. <laughs> and the clothes are piling up. And before long, many of us, we get like the flies who have now landed on the fly paper. And they tell everybody around them, I got the fly paper right where I want it. <laughs> but before long, the fly paper, in this case, the world's got you. And you're stuck to it. But worse than that, it's stuck to you. And as a result, before long, you still try to operate in the flesh to keep that spiritual side of things. Could I say, if I can't even get past point number one, if we could get back to putting Jesus first. Yes. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Old fashioned revival was let's just put Jesus first. What a, a unique concept. What an unbelievable idea that you come to a Bible-believing church and instead of hearing about the events that have occurred in the world, whatever they may have been, all of a sudden somebody's telling you, guess what we need to do? As Bible believers, we need to get back to Jesus. We need to get back. Our relationship with him is waning. Hey, I realize this. If I get so easily offended, it usually is indicative of the fact that my relationship with him is not as it ought to be. And before long, I begin to look at my life and I go, you know what? I didn't read my Bible as much this week because I just got busy. It wasn't because I was doing anything bad or wrong. I just, it just wasn't important. But I sure did stop to eat. 
I made sure I got my egg bites in the morning and my lunch and got my little snack in between and, and then had whatever I wanted for supper and, oh, can't go to bed without a little snack. You know, don't want my stomach waking me up during the night. I came up with the thought. If we would read our Bible every time that we sat down to eat, we probably would become biblical scholars because we eat far too often. But we probably would also reduce the size of our girth because our mind would be occupied on something other than ourself. Isn't it interesting how we generally eat on average, even though it's not even a biblical principle, that we eat on average three times a day? They call it three square meals. None of us need that many meals, but the Bible says, I mean, but, but we believe, got to have three square meals and then a couple of snacks. But could I ask you this? Have you ever thought about feeding your spirit that often? Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. So listen carefully to wake up from where you're at. Let me hear, make sure you hear me now. I admire the Muslims. At least they go through the, the, the outside uh, uh, routine of praying a minimum of three times a day, wherever they are. And Christians mock and make fun of that because they're worshiping the wrong God. I understand that. I believe that. But you cannot, the discipline that they have and the commitment that they have and all Christians can do is talk about it instead of emulating something that is right. They are committed to their cause. They are literally willing to die for their cause. And Christians are just asked to suffer a little bit. Can I say this first of all? Trying to serve God in the flesh is not going to last very long. It won't take long before it wears you out in the flesh. Remember the passage I gave you the other day about sowing the seed and the seed comes up and the cares of this world and so on and so forth come in and choke the word and it is of none effect. Remember that in the Gospels? I think persecution can also create or cause Christians to just get worn out. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, chapter number seven, he said the devil is there to wear out the saints in the last days. Yeah. And some of you are just worn out. Just tired all the time. You're physically tired, we go take a vacation to regenerate our batteries. But when was the last time you took a vacation from the world and decided that you needed to recharge your spiritual batteries? I realize that sounds hard, but it is after all church and you are in a doctor's office per se and you need to have somebody to tell you, hey, guess what? You got a problem. You're sick. And if you don't change your diet, guess what's going to happen? You don't realize, ladies and gentlemen, if you're constantly putting pornography in front of your eyes and rock and roll music in your ears and you're stuffing your face with bran flakes or whatever it is that you eat all the time, before long you'll be a blooming idiot. You can't keep putting that stuff in there and expect a different result. That is the epitome of insanity to expect you to keep doing what you're doing throughout the world's day on a regular basis and then maybe three times a week come to church and listen to some ogre get up and yell at you. You will not be able to offset what you're putting in. Amen. Hey, you can eat a salad three times once a week. And donuts and other stuff the rest of the time, I guarantee you, you ain't going to lose an inch. But I'm eating salad, but you ain't eating enough of it. Because you're eating too much of the other stuff, there's not enough room for the right stuff. And then before long, you wonder why we're a spiritual flop. And that's when persecution comes. I'm talking real persecution. I mean, difficulty and trouble comes your way. Sometimes it costs you your family because you believe the Bible and you do what's right to do according to the Bible and sometimes your family will kick you to the curb. You've heard stories about that around here. Sometimes it's your friends. And they don't want anything, want anything to do. And all of a sudden don't want anything to do with you. And all of a sudden the, 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 the luster of being around Bible believers and you realize that they're not going to go the places you go and do the things you do and all the popularity that you thought that you had, all of a sudden it wanes and the Lord said, well, I mean, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Amen. But we've lost not only the pioneering spirit but the desire to be persecuted for the right reasons. 
I don't want to get persecuted because I take some political position and decide what side of an aisle I'm going to be on or what party I'm going to represent. But I should learn and realize that the people that have gone on in the past, Martyr's Mirror and Fox's Book of Martyrs and, and those individuals like uh, Brother Roloff and Dr. Ruckman who suffered a lot more persecution than many of you are aware of. He just never made a big deal. He always played it down. But it cost him greatly and dearly to stay around until he was in his 90s. I appreciate the faithfulness. Would you be willing to die at an early age because of your faith in the book and your faith in Jesus Christ? Would you be willing to go to places nobody else would be willing to go? Would you be willing to stand up there for days and days and days like uh, Brother Popoff did and have them mock and belittle and make fun of you and torture you and then be told by the Lord, they're not torturing you, they're torturing me and stand there for years, be put in a prison, cast aside for persecution. You know what happens nowadays? I can say this and I try to say it as gracefully as possible. There's very few men and women anymore that can take much persecution. The first thing happens is if somebody said, oh, you're a Bible believer. Oh, I, oh not, not, not really. I mean, I kind of am. You go over there where all they do is sing songs and a guy gets up and yells at you. I mean, why don't you hostile a tie, untie a bow tie economy Honda and, and why don't you be slain in the spirit and why don't you have a rock and roll band up here and have some drums? I mean, why don't you get with it, man? And why don't you get things going? And why don't you loosen up in your dress and loosen up in the way you talk and loosen up in the way you do things and that little bit of persecution and you're saved and out the door. But they couldn't keep you with wild horses away from Walmart if there was something there you wanted. Amen. They couldn't keep you out of your favorite restaurant. But they can keep you out of the right church by just saying a couple of little things that makes you feel like they're not going to like you. They don't care about you anyway. All they're trying to do is to get you to conform to what they want you to get conformed to. That's not friendship. But sometimes persecution can get you. You go to school and you witness to somebody and they laugh at you and make fun of you. They talk about you around the water cooler. Oh, here comes the Bible thumper. Here comes Mr. Goody Two Shoes. Here comes Miss Goody Two Shoes. Oh yeah, look at her. She can't go with us. Look at him. They don't go to, oh, they, they don't go to those places. Thank you, I sure don't. Amen. I don't want to be guilty by association. I don't want to be involved in anything that makes it look like I'm going the way the rest of the world is. But I know, I know that's not for everybody. I've been told that just recently. It's not a big deal. Don't worry. Don't sweat. No, it's no big deal. I mean, you know, it's just a little bit of the world. I mean, so what? Everybody else does it. Well, hate to tell you this. I'm not an everybody. Oh, you, you're perfect. Far from it. But ladies and gentlemen, that persecution is to try to drive you away and break your fellowship with him. He don't go everywhere you think he goes. Amen. He doesn't follow after you even though he doesn't spank you. He doesn't run with you. You say, why? You left him back there where you decided to split away from him. Not long before what happens, you know what he says? He says, guess what? Um, I, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm quitting. The persecution's too great. Some of you, it's cost you a spouse. It cost the old preacher a spouse. Some of you, it's cost you the friend. Some of you, it's cost you your family. Some of you, the persecution comes in the form of disease. Disease can drive you away in a heartbeat. You say, why? Because you think you don't deserve it. You think you shouldn't be sick. You think the wicked people should be sick and the Ted Bundys of the world and the John Wayne Gacy's of the world and, and the, 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 the individuals that, that are out there, Koresh and, and uh, all those individuals, those, those people, they deserve to be sick, but not me. The apostle Paul got sick and he asked the Lord three times and the Lord said, nope, I'm not taking it away from you. Uh, my grace is sufficient for you. When you're weak, I'm strong. Shut up and take it. 
Boy, the whining and crying when the disease comes our way. I'm the world's worst when the flu jumps on you or COVID jumps on you or something else. It's worse than anybody's ever had it. It's the word your throat's more raw than any throat's ever been or your hangnail's the worst than anybody's ever had. You're going to have to have a special surgical team flown in from Bethesda, New York to come in to operate on your toe because it's worse than anything that's ever been in the entire world. And before long, the next thing happens is your testimony is gone because of persecution in your flesh. What the devil did after he turned Job's family against him and his, his own people against him and turned his wife against him, the next thing he did was jump on him with his uh, spiritual, I mean, with sickness. Lost all of the property that he had. Lost the family that he had. Wife turned against him. And Job said, well, you keep a hedge around him. Let me have his body. And he broke out in boils and sat there with pieces of pottery and scraping the pus off those boils and stuff. And then have people come in there and then judge him and say, Job, you're the problem. And Job, you did this. And Job, you did that. And he sat there miserable in sackcloth and ashes with no comfort whatsoever. I've seen that kind of persecution put many a Christian down and out. I've watched Christians, ladies and gentlemen, come through different things like that. And I wonder how come it is that a lot of great men, a lot of great women that have done things for God, they have invalid children. Why'd my mom and daddy lose their first child? They're both gone. Nobody can get any bragging rights about that. There's no pride in that stuff and all that. Why you have a missionary that's here that had that happen? What'd he do wrong? You know what the devil will do? The devil will jump on him and say, there must be something wrong with you. You must have done something. You must be doing that. Now, what if that's for God's glory? But boy, when that chicken comes home to roost, and the next thing you know, all of a sudden, it's Lord, well, you know, I understand them and them and them, but why me? And persecution gets on you. Boy, if you don't walk in the spirit, you know what can happen? Can I say this? Persecution sometimes comes, unbelievably so, from family that you expect otherwise from. I mean, you raise your kids right, and you raise them in church, and you send them to youth camp. You do everything you know to do to put the book in them. They get saved at an early age. Can you turn on some air conditioning? I'm persecuted right now. And, but, but, but all of a sudden, you get saved at an early age, and then the world grabs them and gobbles them up and takes them off. And you, Bible-believing saint, King James Bible, don't miss a church service and give over and above your tithe and all that other kind of stuff. Do everything you can for the Lord and you got prodigal kids. And prodigal kids, ladies and gentlemen, it ain't like anything else. The only time you forget about it is when you go to sleep. Amen. The rest of the time, the second you wake up and the second you go awake during that day and before you go to sleep, that first and last thought every single day is what about that kid? 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 You know what the devil does? The devil takes that stuff and persecutes you with it. You'll have so-called Christians that'll come up to you and you know what they'll do? They'll look at you and say, well, if you're really saved and God's really so real and God's done all these things for you and that kind of a deal, let me ask you a question. If that's the case, why'd this happen with your kids and why'd that happen with your kids and what about this with your kids and what about these lies and what about these stories? You say, what is that? That's the devil trying to make you quit. Amen. Trying to get you out. Why? Because what you got is valuable. It matters or he wouldn't be persecuting you. He wouldn't be troubling you. You wouldn't have trials. You say, why? Because it's all that matters. But in the last days, you know what he says? He said, you better consider him. You better think about it. Consider him. I think about it. That pressure getting on you on a regular basis. I'm talking about real persecution. I'm not talking about persecution because somebody parked in your spot or sat in your seat or sang your song or played your special or got called or what. what I, I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm talking about real sure enough persecution. You say, why am I getting persecuted, preacher? Because you must be doing something right. Because it's what the Lord said is going to happen in the last days. All the devil wants to do is, is when you die, he'd love to stand over your grave and laugh and say, well, I couldn't take his soul, but I sure did mess him up along the way. And listen to a preacher stand there and lie. Well, he's a good person, you know. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> he ain't gonna do that in front of the Lord at the judgment seat. Who wants a preacher to say that? 
Thank God you're saved, ladies and gentlemen. And this is mostly to save people. But if I consider him, who in the world deserved to be able to have the persecution that he had? They spat on him. They plucked his beard out. They plowed his back like furrows out of a freshly plowed field. Uh, they beat him. They put upon him a crown of thorns and they beat him to within an inch of his life. And had he been human, all human, he would have died there, but he waited until he laid his life down and purposely took it. And naked, they nailed him up to a tree. I understand me being persecuted, but how do you persecute perfection? Holiness. Purity. Consider him. He didn't deserve it. I hate to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for men even to get a thicker skin. You can't even look cross-eyed at anybody anymore. They're just, oh, I can't believe what he said. He raised his voice. It's insane to me nowadays how feminized the world has become. And I can tell you it ain't the women. The men quit being men. And I don't mean because you can ball up your fist and knock a woman out. I mean you quit having enough spiritual backbone to be the one that gets up and reads your Bible and gets up and prays and leads the family to church. It's always the women and the children. And now you've lived long enough to see the generations of that. And the majority of churches today, if they have anybody at all, the majority of them are filled mostly with women because the men don't have any grit in their crawl and any stamina in their heart. They're not going to listen to some preacher tell them that they could be wrong. It's always this discussion thing. I wonder to myself what it is that makes us do it. I consider him who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Mocked, belittled, made fun of, had the ability without even doing anything to simply speak the word and could smite the one that is smiting him. And he just took it. They didn't have to hold him down to nail him down. He stretched out his arms and said, go ahead. And the very ones that dropped that two and a half pound sledgehammer on his arms and dropped that nail down into his arms and into his feet and pierced his side and drove that crown of thorns down upon his head, he is the very one that he said, as a man, Father, forgive them. That's a man. Pilate says about him after he took that beating, he said, behold the man. He's shocked. He's like, man, you got to be kidding me. How's he still standing? I consider him when I think to myself about persecution that comes my way, about my fleshy service, about my desire to do things in the flesh for recognition or appreciation. But ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you, there's another one if those two don't get you. It stands between you and finishing how God would have you to finish. The devil will use the weapon of temptation against you. And temptation is not always uh, a certain things to do as far as the flesh is concerned when it comes to sexual desires. When you hear that word nowadays, the first thing you think of is that. Temptation can be God call you to go to Bible school and you're tempted because the devil says, now wait a minute, if you're going to do that, how are you going to have time for your family? And how are you going to have time for your career? And how are you going to have time for what you're planning on doing and where you're planning on going? I tell you what, maybe you could do Bible school after you finish this school and that school and after you get your degree here and after you get your degree there. Or as has happened to some of you, I tell you what we'll do. I'll let you go to Bible school, but let me pick the school and I'll pay for it. So you can get one of those degrees where it's accredited and then you have Bible school, but you get the regular courses. And so well, let me go ahead and pay for it. You say, preacher, that's not that big of a deal. Don't tell me that ain't a temptation. The story is told of a young girl who, who sold out the Lord and was going to go to the mission field with her husband. They were going to get married and so on and so forth. And daddy stepped in and said, honey, I understand you want to do that, but I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll stay home, I'll buy you a new car and you can go wherever you want to go and we'll stretch out at nighttime and let you be able, if you want to, instead of coming in at nine, you can come in at 12. And the story is told that after a short period of time, she had quit going to church. She married some rock and roll drummer. And after a, about three or four years, you couldn't find the drummer anymore and she was divorced with a couple of kids and you couldn't find her sitting in the church anymore. 
You say, why, Daddy? Made it rain. Anywhere but God, anywhere but church, anything but... Amen. The preacher talks like this nowadays. I'm considered to be so out of step with time, man, you'd think I was spastic or something. You'd think I have no sense of time and I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. You say, what are you talking about? I'm saying consider him. And when you look at him, you know what he did? He left the portals of glory and left everything he had up there to come down here. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself Lord and the angel. And he learned obedience by the things he suffered. He walked in a human flesh like you and I. And since eternity began, had never ever been in obedience to anyone. And came down here and made himself obedient to his own creation. Temptation, you know, people make so light of it that after 40 days in the garden, those last three temptations, he comes up there, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and he tempts the Lord in those last things. Don't tell me he doesn't tempt it in all points yet without sin. Amen. You needn't worry about the papers on the impeccability of Christ. He couldn't have been tempted if he couldn't have sinned, but he chose not to sin. Well, I'm not Jesus. Yeah, he was God manifest in the flesh but chose to be a human being, two natures, and resisted the temptation and then tells you to do the same thing. Temptation what? Not to just go drink, not to just smoke, and not to have premarital relationships and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about stuff on a much higher ground. You're, on, you're in the waiting pool there. God calls you to go do something and you quit before it gets done because it didn't get done the way you wanted it to get done. Temptation. To do what? Quit before the job's done. Quit before you finally climb the last mountain. Quit before you see God in the end. Quit before you see God accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And I must have some kind of an audience this morning or the Lord wouldn't have put that kind of a message on my heart. There must be in the last days some people that are ready to walk out on God because they're tempted to do what they want to do instead of what God says to do. I believe in the old adage of head and eyes. I know I'm just a smidgen past noon. If you got to go, I understand, but can you bear with me? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to hurt your feelings, so take it personal. One of the things that will get your eyes off of finishing right because you're not considering him because you are overwhelmingly consumed with future events. You're consumed. I, I, I'm aware of all the conspiracies. I have somebody I depend on that vets certain things and checks resources and that kind of a deal, but it is not the number one thing in my life. What do you think about what happened? What happened? Half the time when they say, you know what happened? No. Amen. Well, some kind of preacher you are. Okay, well, we'll see you tomorrow because they're not coming looking for headlines. They already read that. Amen. They're looking for what does the Bible say? Amen. And I'm not going to take the Bible and make it fit whatever the headlines is. Ripped from the headlines. What do you think it is? I will say this much about what occurred yesterday. If he'd have laid down for three days and got up, I would have thought, okay, that might be somebody else there. <laughs> And it ain't Jesus. I mean, I'd be walking around like this. What are you doing, man? I'm looking for feet, Mama at least to say. What do you mean? I'm looking for feet, man. Who's that? The feet of Jesus. He's coming soon, man. If that guy came up, man, I'm not going to be here during the tribulation. Some of you will get that. What is, what, is he, what is he talking about? This is a terrible tragedy. You see, you're just landlocked. You're earthly minded, worldly minded. All of a sudden something happens and it causes a wrinkle and the Lord says, hey, look up, your redemption draws nigh. You realize just like that, I can change events just like that. I can send a microscopic bulb just like that. Oh, things are bad. Things are scary. Things are terrible. Oh man, things are exciting. Things are getting close. We're getting ready to go to the house. I mean, I get to see God's hand every day doing things and allowing things to occur. Preacher, what do you think? I don't know. I got to get my Bible done first. 
constant obsession with things that are going on. There are more conspiratorial websites out there than have ever been and everybody has an opinion and you don't even have to have any qualification to write an article or to have a blog. And what's worse is some of you believe it. You never even, you remind me of people that used to give money to Robert Tilton or Jimmy Baker or Jimmy Swaggart. I mean, you think they should have gone to jail? No, I think you should have gone to jail for supporting, uh, for de contributing to the delinquency of a minor. <laughs> Some of you believe that over what the Bible says. And you read the news before you read what does the book say. You honestly think that what's happening in our little corner of the world is the most important thing in eternity right now? You think the Lord hasn't seen this scenario played out a multitude of times? Just give you a word of advice. If you insist on doing that, you better check your resources. Tell us about that. I'm here to preach to you. Preacher, what are your sources? The Bible. The rest of the stuff doesn't matter. Can I say this? This is a tough one. Only a couple more, Bubby. We'll get out of here. Bubby's sitting on the edge of his seat. I don't think it's because he's ready to go. I think he's ready to get right. <laughs> Feeling sorry for yourself. You live in a day where that has become sort of, in a sense, the most unique thing because people have taken precedence over Jesus. Yep. Precedence, that means they're, they're ahead of. Why? Well, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat worms, little bitty skinny ones and big old fat ones. I'm going to go eat worms. Why? Because nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. The idea of feeling so sorry for yourself, literally what it does is it raises you up and lifts you up and gives you and makes you the center of attention. It is the epitome of conceitedness. I have never one time known what psychiatrists call a narcissist, what the Bible calls just purely selfish. The greatest narcissist in the Bible... The, the devil in Isaiah 14, I will ascend, I will, I will, I will, I will. You know what that is right there? That feeling sorry for yourself? That's I, 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 me, me, me. Consider him. Tell me when he ever said, don't you all feel sorry for me? This is a terrible thing they're doing to me. Isn't this bad? Why don't you do something about it? Can you find that for me? You never see him feeling sorry for himself. But nowadays it is such a common practice it should be in the next Olympics. Because even the church has become professions at making it about us instead of about him. I know that's hard. But you have been trained by the news media and by social media that you are the most important thing in the world. And you're so malinformed that you believe that you actually have a case. Social media has so convinced you that you're so important based upon how many followers you have. And who reads your text and who responds and what the world has to say that all of a sudden, you know what you're seeing? You're seeing an entire generation of individuals that have been corrupted. And I'm talking about old people yep. trying to relive their heydays yes, yep. through a keyboard. Yep. Amen. And a bunch of young people that if they don't get their ways, pout. Consider him. When did he pout? Come on. When did he go to the man cave? Good. Could you tell me this about Jesus? Uh, I mean, he worked until he was 30 and then he went into ministry. And of course, everybody knows the ministry, you just, you know, you preach three times a week and play golf the rest of the time or go fishing or hunting or whatever. You don't do nothing else. Everybody knows that. So up until he was 30, he was pretty busy. But if you follow the life of Jesus Christ, you realize he was a pretty busy individual. Could you tell me where he sat down and sulked? 
You know, the only time he got with the Lord up there and he said, Lord, is there any way this can pass for me? Right. That's Gethsemane. Right. He's not being disobedient. He's saying, Lord, uh, this is, Father, can you let this pass? Nope. Okay. For the joy, you read it, that was set before him, he endured the cross. Amen. He didn't sit down and have a pity party. Please don't get mad at me. I've got to tell you the truth and please don't get so upset. But if you're one of those, snap out of it. The only reason you think that way is because you think more highly of yourself than you really are. Thank you, Brother Joe. Nobody else is shaking their head. Brother Jerry's got me going now. He's like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's true. I can count on Brother Jerry for that. Ladies and gentlemen, you are living in a self-centered society. And everything is driven for how we can get you what you want and what's for your benefit and what will make you safe and how you can do this and how can you do that. Consider him. What did he think about? He looked upon a crowd of people and had compassion and he wept over them. He wasn't concerned what happened in the everyday events of the world. He was concerned about souls. That's why he died. He wasn't concerned about having his vengeance that day. Can I give you one more and we'll go to the barn? The old preacher years ago, as at house, walked by there in the hallway and there's a picture there. I wish I could have got it. I don't know who has it, but I wish I could have got it. It spoke to me more than anything else. I'm just standing there looking at it. It's one he's drawn a bunch of times and I'm just standing there looking at it. He said, what do you see, man? And I said, well, I don't know. I guess this snake right here, the devil and... I guess that uh, lion is the Lord going to eat the snake and all that. And he said, yeah, you missed it. Let's eat. <laughs> Appreciate that warm <laughs> kindness, you know. <laughs> and we sat down there and we ate for a little bit and went back down the hallway. And I said, uh, don't look at that picture again. He said, okay. He said, well, what do you see? And I told him some other cockamamie thing. And he said, yeah, you missed it again. He walked off. I said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Where are you going? And he said, oh, going back in here, it's time to take a nap, man. Y'all lock up the house when you leave. I got to go. <laughs> I said, well, hold on before you go. I said, what is that? And he said, oh, that snake, that's a little thing. He said, that's just sin and different things like that and get in the way and that kind of a deal. And I said, what about that lion? He had the, the lion was like this, growling, snarling, about ready to attack, bigger than the man in the picture. And he said, oh, that's easy. He said, that's the number one killer of Christians. I said, the devil. And he said, no, the devil's chump change compared to this. I said, it's bigger than the devil? And he said, yeah, it's a whole lot bigger than the devil. He said, this thing right here takes more credit for kicking more Christians out than the devil will ever have credit for. I said, well, what is it? And he smacked me in the chest like that. He said, it's routine duty, boy. He said, it's doing the same thing day in and day out and day in and day out because it's right to do. And if God doesn't change the orders, you do the same thing day in and day out. He said, it takes character to fight that one off. Just doing the same sag, bag, and drag. What'd you do today? Read my Bible, prayed, successful day. What'd you do today? Read my Bible, prayed, did my job, successful day. What'd you do today? I did my job, got a raise, got married, got a couple of kids, got a boat and a car, and got a house, got a career, got recognition, got appreciation, got voted into the trustee board at the church. And when I go, I'm, I'm a part of that. They better not have a business meeting without calling me. You know how that is. I'm a businessman now. What happened to your routine duty? Oh, I don't do that anymore. I, I've been to Bible school. I studied when I was three years in Bible school. I don't need to study now. Uh, why, I know more, quote, than most of the teachers in your school, end quote, by a guy who wanted us to give him, confer upon him a degree because he claimed to have read all of Dr. Ruckman's material and claimed to know more than the teachers in the school. I said, they got one thing on you you don't have. And he said, yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. I, I could reach through the phone. He said, yeah, what is it? And I said, they had the discipline to park there behind in a bench and listen to somebody teach them. And you won't get a degree from us. 
I not do that much disrespect to the people, including women, who sit there and do without so they can get that thing. No, sir, not at all. I thought you'd say that and hung up the phone. Goodbye, good riddance. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to put in the sweat? You don't deserve that good degree. People walk up here, sometimes that'll be the only thing they ever finished in their life. And I'll not disrespect them by letting somebody have it free of charge. You're going to earn it. What are you talking about? Routine duty? Coming to church for Sunday school? Coming to church for Sunday morning? Coming to church for Sunday night? Coming to church on Wednesday? It's funny how church attendance increases when tribulation comes. And then all of a sudden things kind of lighten up and everything else floods in and before long, tell me it's not the routine duty that goes the way of the American Indian. Pun intended cast aside, forgotten about, could care less. Got a better way. Routine duty is there and it is used of the devil to try to get you to quit. He does not care how he gets you to quit. He just wants you to quit. What's routine duty? It's marriage. You say, what is that? Well, boys, it's waking up after 45 years and going one more day. And as much as you think you got it and you should have somebody half her age, she's got to look at your miserable behind, or excuse me, uh, well, it's already been said now. <laughs> she's got to look at you every day. It's one more day for her too. You're raised in a generation where if it don't go right, the first thing you hear is, I quit. I quit. You go to work somewhere, they give you a job, and they say, here's what we want you to do, sweep the floor. I quit. That's not my, I, my, I can't, my hands don't fit a broom. I can't use a shovel. I didn't sign. That's not in my job classification. I'm too good to clean out the toilet and to sweep the floor and to shovel the manure. I, I'm, I'm too good to do that. Now, if you got a special thing, job that I can be dressed up and fixed up where my skill set can be on display for everyone to see, well, then we're talk. I quit. I quit the first time you have a good knockdown drag out. I mean, I'm talking one in the house where you're hoping and praying the neighbors ain't going to call 911 on you because somebody getting killed. I know y'all never had none of those. We've had one or two. Them knockdown drag outs are great excuses for makeup time. If you ain't too proud to say, hey, baby, I was wrong. You might have to take her to dinner and light a candle. You say, what is it about? One more day, you hear me? This I quit stuff, it's for the kids. It's for the ne'er-do-wells. It's for the flash in the pan. It's for the Roman candles. It's not for the men and the women in the Bible who no matter what endured that. Consider him. What did he do? He didn't quit. Walks along there and took my sin, took your sin, took the sin of this stinking county, took the sin of this city, took the sin of the world, took the sin of everybody and said, you got any more? I'll take it all. Lord, don't you want to quit? No. Fell on his face. What did he do? Got up and went on. That's your standard that you live by. I can't imagine a Savior that would say, I quit. That sounds so effeminate to me. You live in a day and time where it's very difficult anymore for people to just do what's right to do, like go to work every day. My aching back. COVID comes along and now everybody thinks they're the master of a computer and you think the idea of working is put on your footy pajamas, get an extra helping of hot cocoa and sit at the house. I got to go to work. You went from your bedroom to the bathroom to the kitchen to the living room and you at work. Shut out all the office buildings. Why? One of the things that is tested when it comes... They, listen, they didn't pay me for driving time to drive from my house to work. Nowadays, it's like, you going to pay me driving time? I'm on the clock from when I leave the house. You are smoking crack. 
It is a privilege to have a job. You gonna pay me overtime? You didn't work no overtime. You gonna pay me for the time you stole from me at lunch and coffee break and everything else? I'm gonna file a lawsuit on you. You didn't pay me overtime. I worked over 40. You ain't worked over 20 a day you have been here. I don't care how much your time card says. I'm talking about work. You get up before dawn, you say what? To go to work. Come home after the sun drops over the horizon. Why? Coming home from work. Saying goodbye to your family and to your kids to do what? Provide for your family. Do you provide for them spiritually? Who was Jesus Christ? Wasn't he God manifest in the flesh? I believe he was. Did he deserve it? No. Do we? Yes. They called him all kind of names. They said he was a little bastard boy born out of wedlock. You know what he said? I quit. You called me a name on Facebook. And now everybody out there knows. Aren't you glad they don't know the truth? Yes, sir. I mean, what God knows about you? Some of you guys, you're so holy. If these women weren't in here, I'd be real straight with you. You say, what do you know about a man's mind? I'm a man. I don't mean I'm a man. <laughs> I mean, I'm a homo sapien. <laughs> I'm male. You're a dog. And if your wife knew the filth that runs through your brain, you wouldn't be sitting here all high and mighty and holy and perfect and all that stuff. You ain't fooling me. You sure ain't fooling him. So preacher, what are you talking about? My aching back. Consider him. Think about what he did. Think about the routine duty. What did he do? He got up every day. No flush and commode. No shower. Build a fire. Cook some food if they had any food. Walk from one destination to the next destination. Preach a little while, be despised and be rejected. Doesn't get anything for it, winds up going along. <laughs> he, I mean, listen, don't tell me them apostles weren't as hungry as the 5,000 were. They wanted something to eat too. Yeah. Paul said in fastings often and in hungerings often. Sometimes he did it on purpose, but sometimes he was that way for a reason. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the number one killer of Christians that's fastly dissipating nowadays. Churches are drying up. You say, why? Because of routine duty. The preacher, we've been going for all this time and ain't nothing happened special. Your job is, listen, listen, at work, it ain't always something happening special, but you don't quit work. <coughs> Sometimes you go into work, you know what you do? The same thing you've done for 20 years. You don't, you don't, all, huh? nothing happened exciting at work today. But let nothing happen exciting in church. You know what you think? Well, that church's dead. I just ain't getting fed. I, you know, it's just kind of dragging around there a little bit. It's funny how you can make that kind of a decision after, generally speaking, two or three hours a week in church. You work your job for 40 hours. I bet if I ask your wife, anything exciting happen around the house lately? <laughs> let that sink in a minute. Yeah, I thought my husband got Alzheimer's or dementia the other day. He was up on the roof fixing the roof. has been leaking for 20 years. I, I don't know what in the world got into him. That was pretty exciting. I thought that somebody new moved in. <laughs> Told us it's been clogged for a month. He finally fixed it. I about fell off my rocker. <laughs> Lord have mercy, he took the garbage out without me telling him to. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> and you come to church and it's, same old man preaching the same old message. And the same old songs. And the same old pews and the same old carpet. And the same old church. You say, what is it? It's life. It's routine. Why are you here? Because it's right. I have a confession to make. I have to do it. I believe the Lord will whoop me if I don't. I don't always read my Bible because I feel like it. I'm not, I'm not like y'all. You're hyper. You're like, oh, preacher. When I come, the little choir of angels begins to sing. A little Shekinah light comes down like the Apostle Paul. I don't even need a, a light on. And I begin to turn the pages of the Bible. I just see the portrait of Jesus jumping off that. That ain't me. 
Sometimes I come to my Bible like I did this morning, heartbroken over a friend of mine who's got major family trouble. And I'm getting ready to pray and I'm looking for where we're going to go today and go back over all of that and I'm thumbing those pages and I'm thinking, Lord, I know you got some comfort, but my mind's not on that and I know I need to read and, and I read because it's right. But I don't always do it when I feel like it. If I did, I wouldn't read it probably at least half the time. Every time I read is not a meeting with the Shekinah glory. If it is with you, I'm so happy for you. But the Lord tested me a long time ago. And here's what he said, not audibly. If I never show up, if I never give you anything else from the book, are you going to quit reading? Or every time you do it, do I have to give you a piece of candy to keep you coming back? Do you love me? Keep reading. And you say, what? Gentlemen, let me ask you a question. You want your wife to be home just because of how it looks? If her mind and heart are somewhere way out there. And to know that the only reason that she's there is because she has to be. Or do you want somebody there in that household because she loves you? Do you think the Lord wants you gathered around him because you have to be? He saved you. You didn't save him. Don't you think it would be a better testimony if these people are here because they want to be? I'll ask you what he asked Peter. Do you love me? I know I'm on unusual ground this morning. I realize, especially with visitors here, they're thinking, man, that's just too much for me. That's a problem with modern Christianity. Modern Christianity is a Christianity of convenience. Because the Lord has yet to strip this country of Bible-believing churches, but it is happening quick. Do you know why? Because of the Bible-believing Christians that are quitting. It's not because He desires to strip the country. It's because Bible-believing Christians have shirked their responsibility for routine duty. I ask you a question, we're closing. When was the last time you considered him who endured such contradiction of sinners? You have not yet resisted unto blood. Staying away from getting out of way of sin. But he did. I look at him, you know what I do? I see a mentor. I see somebody that when it got tough, he just put his head down. I see somebody who set the example of real manhood. And when he could smite, he chose not to. And when he could have burned him up, he chose to take it. But I see somebody over and above all the five or six things I've given you who was committed to the cause of the Father. And when it came to the everyday wake up, put on your clothes, go to the next city, he never quit knowing that every step he took was one step closer to Calvary. And then all of a sudden Calvary came up. You know what he said? I quit. I've been serving you all this time. This is what they think of me. I quit. That ain't what he did. You know what he said? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Heavenly Father, we...